instrument of many uses. It was both an observational and a calculating device. By means of it, one could measure the altitude of a star or the height of a mountain or determine the time of day or night. Religious scholars use the astrolabe to determine the times of prayer and to find the direction of Mecca. Astrologers, who were abundant in the Middle Ages and whose advice was sought by all ranks of Muslim society, used it to derive information for casting horoscopes. Navigators used a simple version for observing the sun and the stars to find their bearings. In centers as wide apart as Baghdad and Cordoba, Cairo and Samarkand, Scholars explored all branches of scientific knowledge. Mathematics, consisting of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, and also natural philosophy, physics, optics, the life sciences, and medicine. They developed algebra and trigonometry into separate disciplines. The rise of Arabic science in the Middle Ages was a momentous event in the history of civilization. It was not an isolated phenomenon, for just as Arabic science was built on Greek foundations, its results were destined to play a part in the later scientific awakening in Europe through Latin translations from the Arabic. Again, television is used to bring the achievements of medieval scientists like Avicenna and Arazi back to life for a popular audience. The medical textbooks these men wrote and the hospital practices they developed were widely used in Europe until early modern times. If she covers the required pregnancy and it's a breach and they want to conclude... Dr. Hassan Hathout is an Egyptian gynecologist working in Kuwait. Okay. His methods would be recognized in any modern hospital in the world. There is nothing medieval about them. But his conscious philosophy as a doctor connects him directly to the values and ideals of medieval Islamic scholars. Of course, all the verses of the Quran, the traditions of the Prophet, were a challenge of the human mind to discover and study the signs of God in his creation. As a matter of fact, you'll find verses in the Quran like, uh, God, please increase me in knowledge. Uh, and are they equal those who know and those who don't? and challenging the human mind to look to the horizons, to the skies, to the earth, to the animals, and in our own bodies. And upon Islam was built a nation, a state, uh, an empire, and a civilization, which was very fond of knowledge and where scientific progress was a sort of worship. It was compliance with the direct orders of God to discover and to heal and innovate, etc. Prior 
Society and learning always went together in Islamic history. The Azhar in Cairo keeps this tradition alive. It has been both a place of worship and a school. Built in the 10th century, it was established primarily for teaching the disciplines concerned with Islamic belief and practice. The sciences, such as mathematics and astronomy, were not part of the regular teaching in the organized school. This reflected a basic division between the religious disciplines and the rational sciences inherited largely from the Greeks. The distinction did not necessarily imply antagonism between these two great branches of learning. The equipment of the religious scholar came to include some arithmetic and astronomy and even medicine. The expert in religious law had to be acquainted with algebra for solving problems in the division of inheritances. Thus, the demarcation line between the religious and non-religious sciences gradually came to be blurred. It was here at the Azhar that Ibn al-Haytham, one of the greatest Arab scientists, lived and worked in the 11th century and other notable scientists were formally appointed in the great mosques as muwakkits in charge of regulating the times of prayer. The scientist and the engineer were often one and the same individual. Islamic mathematicians were consulted about city planning, the cutting of canals, and the setting up of water wheels. They wrote about the construction of vaults, decorative designs for the use of artisans, and mechanical devices, such as water clocks, water lifting devices, pumps, fountains. Sometimes these contrivances have been looked upon as frivolous gadgets intended for the amusement of the patrons for whom they were made. And indeed, some of them do look like toys, mechanical birds, whistling birds, flutes, and robots for dispensing drinks. But they should rather be viewed as illustrations of mechanical ideas that might have had a wider range of applications. Technology in the modern world is of quite a different order. Kuwait's solar energy project illustrates both the process of historical transmission and the problems of today. The geometry of these solar reflectors was known to the Greeks. Arab mathematicians elaborated the earlier treatments, and one of these elaborations found its way to Europe in Latin translation. In the past, Arabs were able to assimilate scientific traditions that had virtually come to an end. In contrast, a country like Kuwait is trying to keep up with a fast-moving technology. Uh, always, when you do a project, you discover, well, I would have done it better uh, some other way. Uh, and also, the other question is, uh, could I have used the amount of money allocated for this project for other developmental activities? With hindsight, you can do a lot of things, uh, but that's the purpose of research. You, you make mistakes. Uh, I, wouldn't, I don't say that this is a mistake, but you make certain decisions and you learn from them. Uh, right now, we are thinking in terms of uh, 
advancing in the area of, let's say, photovoltaic applications, which is direct conversion of radiation into electricity. This, at least on paper, uh, everybody says this is a good, good technology to get into. Uh, five years ago, when this project was decided upon, uh, they said this is a good technology to go into. Uh, at some point, there's going to be a winner, and uh, that's the whole game. So we are, we are with it, at least. One should not be discouraged. Fusion energy, for example, in the West has been promised in the 50s, and scientists and governments promised that in 10 to 20 years they'll have fusion energy, nuclear fusion, not fission. And we are in 1984 now, and still they're saying another 20 years. And they have been pouring billions, not millions, billions into fusion. Uh, I think uh, maybe the policymakers might get discouraged, but I think our role as, as technical managers is to make sure that we are capable of saying when we have to make shifts, but at the same time when we have to insist that there is no need for a shift. Although we might not have achieved the result we sought after, but we have learned a lot, and this will help us in the future work. So I would say in solar energy, on the contrary, uh, I feel more encouraged because we have learned a lot over the past four years. For us, it is a lot. Maybe for the world, it's still small. But for us, as a country and as a small institution, it's been a lot. And it's probably proportional to our effort. So I'm satisfied from that point of view. We are not there. We are a long way from being where, where we want to be. But that's the only way. You see, science does not pay off on us. It's not like a commercial project. You know, you, you decide to put 10 million dinars and you get you just, even the failures is a success in a sense. The negative results is a, not the failures, but the negative results. You, you seek to do something and then you get negative results. That by itself is a very important body of knowledge because you don't repeat it, you go after something else. I don't think we are out to beat uh, anybody. I think we are out to uh, uh, do, uh, at least satisfy ourselves, develop certain satisfaction that we are dealing with the elements, we are dealing with our problems. Uh, in a rational way, to, to come up with good solutions. Uh, if some of our scientists come up with good solutions to problems, they can publish papers, patent their inventions, and so on. This is part of the satisfaction. But really, we're not out to beat uh, anybody. Uh, winning is winning really against nature and, and developing a source of satisfaction. I think this is, if we put it as an international game, I think everybody will be a loser. In a generation, Kuwait has changed beyond recognition. The challenges posed by modern science and technology are enormous, and the best way to meet them is not always clear. Should Arab scientists venture into areas of basic research? Should an institute like Kisser concentrate on immediate practical problems? Or should it aim at being a center of scientific excellence in the Arab world? Whatever the answers to these questions, all are agreed that no society can afford to stand still. Experiments must be made, even if risks and mistakes are involved. The West, the industrial countries, and perhaps even other de developing countries who are right now rising in the science and technological fields, are producing every day and they're working and new things are being turned out. We just, we don't have time to sit down and absorb what has been generated in the past and then go on from there because we are running competition. The people who are already ahead of us are moving faster than us. And therefore we have to find a way of moving faster than them. We're working harder than them, if that is physically possible. And that has always to be in the back of our mind. Because if we don't, we're going to feel fine that we're going to fall behind, fall behind, fall behind, and the gap will be wider. The problem with scientists, they only see one track. And they see things in one sequence, in one, you know, one line, or one queue, if you like. Well, as a, as a development economist, if you like, I don't see it that way. And I do not relate scientific excellence or scientific achievement to catching up 
with people other in, you know, up the road or elsewhere. Arab science will and must play a role in world civilization in the future as it played in the past. And if our forefathers were able to do it, why not us? We can. There's nothing to stop us from doing it. But we have to recognize one thing, the stage of development in which we find ourselves. Science requires a certain minimum of infrastructure, both physical and human. And that's what we're trying to evolve and develop. And given that, I see no reason at all why we can't contribute to world civilization in a fashion which is compatible with our own resources. When the United States uh, invaded space, were all the scientists Americans? They were not. I'm sure many of them were from different nationalities, including Arabs, and they contributed their own share in this world and, or, or shall we say, human breakthrough. The invasion of space is an achievement, you know, for the United States because they were able to sustain it, make the resources available and so on and so forth. But the glory is really for mankind. These are more than just pious hopes. Some Arab scientists are in fact participating in such experiments at the highest level. Kazem Behbahani, for example, spends half the year at Kuwait University, the other half in Boston. He is involved in microbiological research at Harvard University. We went uh, all the way to day eight, and we got about 90 percent IA positives. So I see where your controls. Uh, controls are very low. It's about six percent to over 90 percent. They were very bright, and most of the soup we got on the days. Uh, so controls are. Arab, Chinese, and Latin American yes, scientists have come to this laboratory in Harvard as one scholars were drawn to Baghdad or Cairo. These experiments investigate the structure of blood cells. It is possible that knowledge gained here will help cure a blood disease that is prevalent in Kuwait. Whether direct benefits will soon result is perhaps irrelevant. For these Arab scientists, the important thing is to participate in the human search for the truth, as their ancestors, the great Arab and Muslim scientists, did in the past. Every Muslim who is able has the religious obligation to perform the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, at least once in his or her lifetime. But the pilgrimage exhibits much more than individual piety. As Arabs and Iranians, Indians and Africans, 
people from every corner of the earth jointly perform the ceremonies, they reaffirm the community of all Muslims. Muslims believe that the Quran and the Prophet teach mankind how God wishes them to live. Through the ages, Islamic law defined how a Muslim should behave towards God and his fellow man. Islam is the religion of many societies, and everywhere it has expressed itself in local forms. Our film concentrates on one small community in the Sudan. For many Sudanese, Umdubban is a place of great sanctity. It is the site of the tomb of Wet Badr, the Sufi master who is revered as a saint. Sufi means any Muslim individual or sect dedicated to a closer knowledge of God through mystical devotion. By chanting, dancing, or listening to music, the Sufis seek religious ecstasy and to know God through direct personal experience. But in Umdubban, you will also find Sheikh Abdul Razik. This is how Islam has been expounded to the people across the centuries. Sheikh Abdul Razik, sitting beneath an acacia with his book of Islamic law, is the embodiment of orthodoxy. Ali al mak lives in Khartoum. He introduces us to Sudan's ways of faith. At a brochure on the Blue Nile, a Muslim family starts its day with prayer as naturally a part of things as washing, cooking and eating.
Imam lives in a world that craves novelty and diversity. By the standards of his time, Imam's resolve to educate his children at a religious school is rare. Most children go to the government school. Imam is pressing against two generations of change. But behind him are 14 centuries of tradition. لأنه الأولاد ذي يمكن يعني ما في المستقبل يطلع منهم الدكتور يطلع منهم يعني الخبير يعني ما زهر هاي يطلع منهم يعني الصيدلي فأنا برا إذا كان أنت يعني ما صريت أنهم يعني يتعلموا في القرآن في ناحية أنت يعني ما أهملت أنا بصر بعد ما يتم المدة تحت المسألة هي مفروض يمشي المسألة كذا لا أنا صريت في رأيي إن شاء الله برضو دي يطلعوا منها المقصود اللي أنا دايره ولن يحفظ القرآن يطلع منه العالم يطلع منه زول يدرس اللغة العربية بعدين من الناحية الأدبية يعني تجد الطالب بتاع الخلوة طالب المدرسة مش واحد في حاجات في كثيرة في شنو؟ عدل في له وين يعني في شنو في له؟ بيمشوا في تلفزيون في نادي في كورة لكن التلفزيون ماله التلفزيون ما آه انا برا انه هو يعني في 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 هذه اها الناحيه الادبيه طالب الخلوه وطالب المدرسه مش واحد وما خافت الله والانسان بعين اللي والده وعين برعا منك ليه احسن على اولاد المدارس اطلع حتى مهما يكون يعني ذول المدرسه ده مهما يقرا ما بيدخل لي في مزاجي زي قاري خلوه لأنه فعلا نحن الليله في حوجه للتعليم بتاع الخلوه بالنسبه لتراثنا الاسلامي اللي هو القران أنا رأيي ما بتنازل منه. إن شاء الله أولادي بعد ما يمشوا انتهوا من هنا أوديهم ضبان وأوديهم المعهد العلمي وأوديهم الجامعة الإسلامية ما أقصر منهم أبدا عشان يحفظوا لي الدين الإسلامي ما أقصر منهم أنت رأيته أنا ما بعرف لكن أنا رأيي النازل يعني إذا كان يعني موجهتهم كده هم يعني زي المظلومين يعني من ناحية من ناحية الصغافية الله حيكون إن شاء الله تاريخ وديهم تب ما قصر منهم